You can even charge your Tesla in an emergency with a portable solar battery station like the Jackery. What? Greetings and salutations. Thanks for joining me for another video. If you're new to my channel, my name is Brian Hauer and I'm a Tesla travel adventurer who spent almost six months in 2021 traveling around the western side of the US camping and visiting national parks in my Tesla Model Y, which I've modified with a rooftop cargo box, a fridge, and a super comfy bed. After six months of partially camping out of my car, I've tried and tested just about everything. So hopefully that experience can help some of you new EV owners make the transition a little bit easier. In today's Tesla quick tip, we're gonna be taking it back to the basics and showing all these new Tesla owners all the ways you can charge a Tesla. With the incredible growth of Tesla and with so many new owners or ones awaiting delivery, I think it's super important to show them all the options as far as charging so they can decide which one's right for them. Like I said in my recent how-to video where I covered the basics of autopilot, which you can watch up here or click the link down in the description below. This series is for complete beginners. So if you're a veteran Tesla owner, you might wanna skip this video. But if you do stick around, there might be a few things you didn't know as I plan to cover every single way I know that you can charge a Tesla. First up, we'll start with the main way most of you will charge 95% of the time, at home. This is just one of the advantages of owning an EV compared to a gas car. Others include performance, cost to charge, and of course the environmental impact. But just like your smartphone, you simply plug it in at night and every day when you wake up, you have a fully charged car with around 300 miles of range, ready to go. No need to head to gas stations on your way to work or spend 60 plus dollars filling up your vehicle. Charge it at home while you sleep for a fraction of the cost. At home, you have a few different options to charge your Tesla. You simply plug into a regular 120 volt wall charger, just like you would with a blender or a blow dryer. This adapter comes standard with every new Tesla. Now, while this is an option, it should only be used as a last option, as it's super slow and will only give you around two to three miles of range per hour. The next option is your 220 volt dryer plug on a 30 amp breaker. Now I did do another video detailing this method as it's the one I use at my Nashville home. So I will link to that up here as well as in the description down below as it shows how to customize the setup and make it work as close to an official Tesla wall connector as possible. To summarize it, you'll use a 30 amp adapter, RV extension cord and splitter to give you around 21 miles per hour of charging. And it only takes about 30 minutes to set up and costs significantly less than the official wall connector. Make sure to check that video out as it takes you through everything. For this setup, you only wanna use one or the other and not both the dryer and the charger at the same time, or it'll trip the circuit. The third option is using the 50 or 60 amp 220 volt Tesla wall charger which can be installed by a certified electrician and will give you the fastest home charging speeds at 36 to 42 miles per hour of charging. This is also the most expensive option at around $550 for the wall connector, plus another $500 or so for the installation. Now, while expensive, this is the best option if cost isn't a consideration and you know you'll be at your home for many years to come and plan to continue to buy Teslas. Charging your Tesla at home will raise your electricity costs slightly, but it's quite cheap compared to gas and can be offset if you have solar or live in an area with cheap electricity or incentives. Some locations offer lower electricity rates during off hours, like at night, so make sure to check with your power company to see what options they might have. Regardless, it will be significantly less than filling up your car with gas. And as I've already shown, much more convenient. Next, we'll take a look at how you mainly charge when out and about and on road trips. The Tesla supercharger network is vast and the most reliable EV charging network in the world. In the US, there's thousands of stations located mainly at Targets, grocery stores like Whole Foods, restaurants, parking garages at shopping centers, and even gas stations along main interstates. The built-in screen on your Tesla shows a great deal of info about the supercharger you're going to. By tapping on the supercharger, you can view how many stalls it has, 
how many are out of service, how many are currently being used, or if there's a wait. You can also see what businesses are nearby, like restaurants, hotels, or even gas stations. You can view the nearby superchargers by tapping the lightning bolt on the right side of the screen. You can then tap the individual chargers to get more information. When you tap on a supercharger along your route, it will provide how far that is away and how much percentage of battery you'll have when you arrive. This should be very accurate, usually within one to 3%. Tesla superchargers come in a variety of speeds with them mainly being 250 kilowatt, 150 kilowatt, 74 kilowatt, 56 kilowatt, and destination charges, which are usually between eight and 16 kilowatt and are found at casinos and hotels. Most charging sessions can be completed in about 15 to 20 minutes. So by the time you head to the bathroom and grab a quick bite, you should be done charging. So while that's a bit longer than a gas car, it's not an issue in most cases, and I can vouch for that as I've traveled over 21,000 miles in the last six months. If you're going to go from, let's say, 5% to 100%, it might take an hour, even on a fast 250 kilowatts supercharger, but you'll rarely do that. The best strategy is to look at your screen, see what percentage it says you'll arrive at your next supercharger, and leave five minutes after it says you're good to go. The percentage it says is quite accurate, as I mentioned earlier, and can be trusted to within one to 3%. The only time would be more off than that is if you have a cargo box like me, or if you're towing something, or if you're in a mountainous area, so then you might wanna leave a bit more of a cushion. The lower the battery percentage, the faster the Tesla will charge, up to around 85%. Once there, it takes a long time to complete the last 15%. Let's say it takes you 20 minutes to go from 5% to 85%. If you wait for it to get to a full 100%, that last 15% might actually take you more than the original 80%. This is a limitation, or I guess you could say negative, of lithium ion batteries. Smartphones suffer from the same. That's why phone manufacturers always quote their charging times from zero to 80%. This will obviously improve as technology advances. Charging speeds tend to slow as the battery fills up. So you'll likely only get that top speed for a short period at the beginning of the session. That's why faster, more frequent stops usually is the key to a more efficient travel day. Charge to just above what you need to get to the next supercharger. Apps like a better route planner can also be beneficial in helping achieve more efficient results. So what are all those stall numbers on Tesla parking spots used for? Those are used for you and Tesla to identify which charger is which, as well as are used to tell drivers which stalls to use first. The way Tesla charging works is superchargers 150 kilowatts and below share power with the stalls next to them that are on the same number. So often you'll see stall A1, A2, then B1, B2, and so on. It's possible you wanna avoid charging next to someone using the same number, as it will increase the amount of time it will take you to charge since you'll be sharing power with the other driver. This is only on superchargers under 150 kilowatt. 250 kilowatt superchargers operate independently, so it won't negatively affect you if you park next to someone. But anything below 150, and you'll wanna avoid the same number if possible, so you can charge the fastest and get on your way. You can view the supercharger speeds when tapping on the supercharger on the screen. If the supercharger is located behind a security gate, like the Link High Roller Supercharger in Las Vegas is, or inside a parking garage like the supercharger in Lake Tahoe is. The screen will tell you what code you need to enter. For cost, I generally see charging sessions in the 10 to $20 range versus 30 to $50 on my previous gas car. I also did notice remote or small towns specifically out west had much cheaper electricity costs versus major cities. I've gotten almost a full charge for under $8 in places like Wyoming. One thing to watch out for and also to do yourself to help fellow Tesla drivers is to know the universal sign for a charger that is down and not working, as well as how to contact Tesla to alert them when it's down. Usually you can see how many chargers are down by tapping the charger on the screen. And I believe Tesla now knows automatically when a charger is down. But alerting other drivers is also extremely important. To do this, you simply tie up the supercharger's cable in a loop. This will alert all other Tesla drivers that the charger isn't working. You can also call the number on the Tesla signs to alert them. Or some people in the past have had success emailing supercharger at teslamotors.com with the supercharger location and stall number, which is located on the curb or the stall itself. But who knows if that email address is still monitored. And again, I believe they can now tell automatically when a charger is down. 
One other thing to look out for is idle fees. If you don't get back in time when your Tesla is done charging, you could get hit with an idle fee. The Tesla app will alert you when you're about five minutes from finishing, or if you fall asleep like me, link to the video up here and in the description below, you'll get hit with a 50 cent or $1 a minute idle fee, depending on how busy the supercharger station is. Tesla wants to keep people moving so others can jump in and charge. If you're taking up a space and people are waiting, that can really affect someone's schedule. While the time it takes to charge is longer than a gas car, it is getting faster all the time and will continue to improve. But until it does catch up, use common courtesy and move your car as soon as it's done charging. You wouldn't leave it unattended for a long period of time at a gas station in front of a pump, so don't do it here as there's currently far less options compared to a gas station. Sometimes it's the only place in town to charge. If a supercharger is full, you wanna use proper etiquette to establish a waiting line for arriving Tesla drivers. To do this, simply find a side area that isn't blocking people from driving through, but that clearly indicates you're next. Most drivers will easily identify this and will line up behind you. If one doesn't, simply get their attention to alert them the line is behind you. I've never seen a problem with this, so just use common decency and you shouldn't have any issues. Once other drivers who are charging see this, they'll usually end their session as soon as they have enough to get to their next destination. Destination. One subject I get angry even thinking about is icing. If you're not familiar, it's a term used in the EV world when people in gas vehicles or ICE vehicles, which stands for internal combustion engine, decide to purposely block electric vehicles charging stalls with their gas cars or usually pickup trucks. I have so many thoughts on this, I can't begin to touch on it in this video, so I'm going to keep that for another video. All I will say is Tesla China recently started fighting back against this practice by installing floor locking devices at each stall to prevent this. This is a huge problem in many rural areas like South Dakota, where ice holes seem to be doing it to make some ignorant, useless point against electric vehicles. I pray that Tesla implements this soon as they initially screwed up and didn't work with local governments to make it a punishable crime. So many just ignore the Tesla only parking signs and park there anyways. In recent months, I have seen progress on this front as superchargers like the one in Flagstaff, Arizona now have a $350 fine for anyone who parks a non-Tesla vehicle there. I'd like to see Tesla address this problem aggressively in 2022. Now there are third-party charging options like Electrify America, ChargePoint, EVgo, and other regional charging stations you can find on the PlugShare app. But the problem with these is the lack of high-speed adapters for Teslas, as well as the reliability of the charging networks. As stations are frequently down, and more importantly, the cars don't talk to the chargers and give them info, like how many chargers are not currently working or are down for maintenance. This is true for all cars at these non-Tesla DC fast chargers, not just Teslas. There's also horror stories about slow speeds and frequent disconnections with little to no support from the charging company or the car company. One other issue is the inconvenience compared to Tesla superchargers is the fact that you have to pay at terminals like you would at a gas station. And often you have to sign up for another app subscription. Where Tesla superchargers are super convenient with no screen or credit card terminal and the charger talks to the car it knows which vehicle it is and simply charges the card on file in your Tesla account. This solution is much more reliable, convenient, and elegant. Now let's talk about charging standards. I'm sure you've heard of Apple's Lightning Charger or Android's widely used open standard USB-C charger. Well, the same thing kind of happened in the EV world when it came to charging. Tesla created a supercharger connector, which is proprietary, similar to Apple's Lightning cable. And the rest of the EV world later on decided on a standard called CCS, similar to Android using the open USB-C standard. There is now a CCS adapter for Tesla's being used in South Korea and hopefully being released here in North America soon. Tesla also plans on opening up their charging network to third party EVs at some point soon, but for now it's only done that in Europe and is slowly being tested here in the US in a few select locations. So why did Tesla build their chargers this way in North America? Well, as Elon said, there was no standard at the time, so they made one. Again, this is reminiscent of iPhone's Lightning versus Android using USB-C in some ways. One controls the entire experience, a la Apple or Tesla in this case, which usually leads to a better user experience, while the other is open and maybe more superior. But with many different companies in this space, 
all trying to work together, that tends to make things a bit more complex, which leads to issues with customer service and reliability. Now there are other options like Chatmo or even J1772, but these technologies are slower and are on their way out and have been replaced by CCS, which is the standard now in Europe and the Far East. J1772 can still be found at many libraries, department stores like Kohl's, and grocery stores like Whole Foods. They're generally only good for charging in a pinch or if you plan to leave the car for many hours. All Tesla's come with a J1772 adapter, but I do suggest getting a lock so nobody can remove the charger while it's charging. Superchargers don't allow for removal unless it's by someone with a phone associated with the car nearby. A J1772 lock prevents others from removing the charger. I'll link to the one I got on Amazon in the description below. Like most emerging technologies, these issues should be ironed out soon as the EV competition is heating up, with many new startups and legacy automakers jumping in on the incredible demand for electric vehicles. And last, but certainly not least, at least for someone like me who camps around the entire country, we explored campgrounds and RV park charging with a Tesla. Now I did do a video on this, which I'll link to up here as well as down in the description below, but basically most campgrounds or RV parks have a normal 120 volt hookup, 30 amp hookup, and 50 amp hookup. For fast charging, you'll wanna use the 30 or 50 amp and keep the 120 volt for your accessories, like lights or charging camping or powering cooking items. You will need a 1450 adapter from Tesla for the 50 amp. You'll need a RV Tesla adapter for the 30 amp. And of course, the 120 volt charger comes standard with the Tesla when you purchase it. I'll link to everything down below in the description. You'll for sure wanna use the 50 amp or 30 amp when possible and only use the 120 volt when you have no other choice as it will only give you about two to three miles of range per hour. While the 30 amp will give you around 21 miles of range per hour and the 50 amp around 36 miles of range per hour. You can even charge your Tesla in an emergency with a portable solar battery station like the Jackery. You heard that right. Now, I'll save that for a future video so I can show you how much of a charge you can actually get. Spoiler, it's not much, but could work in a pinch and should make for a fun video. All right, so that about wraps up today's video and I think covers all the ways one can charge a Tesla. If I missed anything, please comment below and help out the community. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button and subscribe if you haven't already. And I will see you in the next travel quick tip or review video. Thanks for watching.